Let's start by reviewing the structures we see in the parasternal long axis view. They are the right ventricle, the left ventricle, the left ventricular outflow tract and aortic valve, aortic root, the mitral valve and left atrium and the descending aorta. The pericardium appears as a bright echogenic band immediately posterior to the left ventricle. The left ventricle is normally larger than the right ventricle in the parasternal long axis view. The rule of thirds helps us to understand the relative sizes of some of the key cardiac structures. The right ventricle, which is mostly right ventricular outflow tract in the parasternal long axis view, the aortic root and the left atrium should be equal in size, one third, one third and one third. Significant left atrial enlargement can be eyeballed from the parasternal long axis view using the rule of thirds. It may indicate mitral valve disease, diastolic dysfunction, or long-standing atrial fibrillation. Now let's turn our attention to the valves. We see the mitral and aortic valves from the parasternal long axis view. It is possible to tilt the probe and hence sweep through the mitral and aortic valves in a medial to lateral plane for a more comprehensive assessment. Next, I will show how to position the color box in relation to the aortic and mitral valves. Turbulent flow can indicate valve dysfunction, such as stenosis or regurgitation. Once we have determined a good window for the parasternal long axis exam, it's relatively straightforward to obtain the parasternal short axis view. Occasionally, you may have to slide to a lower inner space while maintaining the same orientation of the probe marker. If you are appropriately centered over the mid left ventricular cavity, you should see the two papillary muscles, which appear as rounded structures in the short axis view. If you are seeing the mitral or aortic valves, you are not in an optimal pocus short axis view, which is at mid ventricular level. This is a good view for assessment of left ventricular function, relative left and right ventricular size and septal position. You may need to tilt or slide laterally or cordially to obtain the correct image. Adjust the depth setting so the left ventricle is fully displayed at the bottom of the screen. Adjust your gain so the blood pool is black, but you can see endocardial structure. Once the image is optimized, acquire the image. Again, if the right ventricle is significantly larger than the left ventricle in this view, consider right ventricular enlargement. Remember though that because of the complex three-dimensional shape of the right ventricle, right ventricular enlargement should be identified in multiple views. In fact, this applies to all aspects of cardiac ultrasound. The more views in which you can visualize the abnormality, the greater your confidence in the accuracy of the diagnosis. The apical four chamber view is an extremely important view in cardiology as it yields a wealth of information. Unfortunately, it is the most challenging to obtain consistently as it is in this patient because of narrow rib interspaces. Start by finding the cardiac apical impulse if it is palpable. Otherwise, start in the fifth intercostal space anterior axillary line. This should be just inferior and lateral to the nipple in men and at the base of the breast tissue in women. The probe marker should be orientated towards the bed. Remember, we are using the cardiology convention here, so the image marker will be to the right of the screen. You will find once you see the heart that small corrections are necessary to optimize the image. Slide or rock the probe to get the heart centered and the septum vertical. If the apex is to the right of the screen, slide the probe laterally. The rocking maneuver often works best to center the septum. Rotate the probe to open out both ventricles so that they appear at their widest. Adjust the depth to ensure that all four chambers are displayed. If you don't see enough atria, tilt anteriorly. If you tilt too far, you will see the aortic root, the so-called five chamber view. Usually two thirds of the length of the heart is occupied by the left ventricle and one third by the left atrium. If the atria are too long in relation to the left ventricle, you have probably foreshortened the image. The correction is to slide to a lower, more caudal interspace. If the image becomes dim and attenuated, you will need to slide the probe back into the intercostal window by sliding cephalad or caudal to move off the rib and back into the interspace, which is our acoustic window. Sometimes controlling respiration can help shift the lung out of the way. Held in mid-inspiration often works best. In this subject, the right-sided structures are not well shown, but we can see them well in other views. Now let's position the color box in relation to the mitral and tricuspid valves. 
Here's an example of a patient with good image quality. Acquire the image. There are actually two views from this window that we will consider. The four chamber view and the IVC view. Both are important. We position the patient differently for this view. The patient should be supine with their knees slightly bent. Sometimes this is the only view that is available in ventilated patients or those with severe COPD. The view is enhanced by asking the patient to hold inspiration. Either a phased array or curved linear probe is appropriate for this exam. Depending on the platform and the probe selected, you may need to change the preset. We will start with the subcostal four-chamber view. For this view, we change the grip on the probe to the overhand or ice cream scoop grip, which allows us to better push down on the probe. A good amount of gel is helpful to maintain probe contact. With the patient correctly positioned, push down and under the xiphoid process. The probe marker is at the three o'clock position with the probe pointed towards the left shoulder or where the heart is. As ever, the image marker is to the right of the screen. Set depth to maximum to start with and you may need to add more gain. Unfortunately, this view is uncomfortable for some patients, so monitor carefully. Tilt and rotate the probe to open out all four chambers of the heart. Now the depth can be adjusted to exclude an unwanted field. Adjust the gains and when the image is optimized, acquire the image. If we rotate the probe through 90 degrees with the probe pointed towards the head and positioned or angled just to the right of the midline, we will see the IVC. The liver now forms the acoustic window as the IVC runs through the liver. Use small rotating and tilting motions to open out the IVC maximally. The IVC size should decrease with quiet inspiration, unless the right atrial pressure is very high or the patient is ventilated. This gives us a clue that we are looking at the IVC and not the abdominal aorta. The presence of the middle hepatic vein coming in perpendicular to the IVC and the fact that the IVC is intrahepatic are other clues. It's a good idea to practice visualizing both the IVC and the abdominal aorta so that you can tell the difference possible, acquire more beats to encompass the full respiratory cycle. Before we finish up, we need to change gloves and clean the probe and cable and allow adequate drying time. Now let's revisit some troubleshooting tips. Be familiar with your platform and the necessary settings before getting started. You will need to select an appropriate probe, usually phased array and cardiac preset. You'll be using depth and gain settings all the time. Working with a patient to get them in optimal scanning position with appropriate breath control can convert a technically difficult exam to one that is interpretable. Once the heart is in view, use small probe movements, sliding, rocking, tilting, to optimize the image. Once the image is centered and the heart is fully opened out, optimize the depth, gains, and don't forget to acquire. If you lose the image, don't panic. Often small adjustments will regain the image. If you're completely lost, go back to the basics of probe position until you see the heart, then start again. Remember that all diagnostic windows are not good in every patient, but most patients have at least one good diagnostic window. Don't be afraid to ask for help if you need it. Thank you.